What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. You know, for instance, like it's like the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shall not kill or treat others like you treat yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to turn that switch off in some cases, and it's unfortunate. So when you come back, men, men and women that are in those situations really struggle to fit in. Because people, they don't, they just, a lot, so many people come to me and they're like, man, people just don't understand. And I'm like, I know, dude, like, I totally understand. I've been there as well. I didn't feel like I fit in society. You know, say you're, you know, you're on an ODA or uh, an A team and you're in some of these, the most crazy situations, firefights against hundreds of people or whatever the thing is, you get blown up. And the, uh, the, the, the things that you see doesn't translate. The things that get you, uh, that keep you alive in combat, get you killed as a civilian is what mm. I like to tell people. That's so then you transition out and you're working for an 18 year old at Home Depot when you just got like, you were doing the most crazy things yep. and seeing the most wild things that, and people struggle with that all the time. And that kind of leads down that path of people, you know, what, you know, just having, a difficulty that is a, is a, is not fitting back into society, you know. When you initially got in, though, basically as a kid, essentially, you know, you wanted to see the action. Right? Oh yeah, man. Yeah, you all all of you. I've never talked to a veteran who did not say that. And it's not like you can know what that is until you do it. But something about then being there, as high stakes as it is, and as and as traumatizing as it is when you know you're watching sometimes your brothers get killed right there in front of you and things like that like there is something about that i want to be careful i say this but like that kind of rush in battle that can never ever those stakes there's literally nothing that can replicate that forget the extreme example of working at home depot when you come back but there's like this this beast that lives inside of you after that and you can't ever turn the switch on and you know let the dog out or something not in a war zone How, it, is there ever going to be a way to solve that because it, it it seems like that's always been a thing throughout human history with warriors when when they go to battle and they come home like it's not there for them like that yeah i'll tell you a good a good it's been going on forever yeah. um and there's there's really good uh good fella um I, I think I've, I've dropped his name before, but he's a former uh, unit guy. Um, his name is uh, Tom Tom Spooner. He runs uh, Warrior's Heart in Bandera, Texas. They're doing great things out mm -hmm. there. I've kind of plugged them before, but it's because when I was still struggling, you know, I was doing a documentary to get started, and quickly, you know, we're still doing one now that we're not paying for. Um, it's going to be privately funded, so it doesn't come from our foundation. Um, but that led me to do the foundation, set it up was so I was kind of in this position where I was still healing. I was doing five treatments through different nonprofits and the VA at one time because I knew when I got diagnosed with cancer in 2019, I knew I had to get my head straight. I knew I wasn't going to figure it out after 12 years. I guess I'm a slow learner, but I was like, oh, I can figure this out. You know, I'm going to work out. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to do goat yoga with feigning gotcha. goats. <laughs> Whatever. I tried everything, man. And I was still drinking and, and, and doing a lot of, uh, you know, substances just to sleep at night. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do at that point. I was like, man, I want to spend the rest of my life serving the veteran community and being the good steward with other people's money to try to, to make a dent. The bigger I can grow this, this, this organization, the more people in turn that I can help. And if I, because I knew the pain that I was in, I was like, look, I've been through special forces, like, you, you know, uh, selection process. Um, I was a high level athlete that, that I suffered a lot. I called myself the professional sufferer. <laughs> and it was like a term that I didn't want to be coined. Like, you know, it's not something to be proud of necessarily. But after having my femur, you know, my hip, my glute, my quad removed, and then, you know, back uh, just two, maybe uh, two years ago in one week, right? I was diagnosed with stage four cancer after having my lung removed, my lower right lobe, after all these other brutal and radical surgeries. Well, that and, was like five and a half years ago now, right? When you were well, diagnosed? Well, I was diagnosed in 19. So that initial diagnosis, um, my 
survive my survival rate at that time was 25 percent mm -hmm. and when i went to stage four which i probably was stage four you know a year before it was it, it you know it started in my hip and my my right femur did a bone graft got the the news back that it was uh cancerous that they would have to go back in the same leg and remove my hip my glute my quad my femur like three quarters of it and it they called it a brutal and radical surgery i was like you yeah, ain't fucking wrong with that <laughs> so when it when it went to my lungs um you know in one month you can be dead it just depends everybody's so different biologically it's just like, you know, you can have something the size of a pea go to a grapefruit in a month. It's just, it's, there's not a lot of data on it because I have, my cancer is less than 1% of 1%. So it's super, you know, it's not as studied as like, say, breast cancer, things that are more common in society. But when I would, that week that I was, man, um, my, I just found out my wife was uh, pregnant, which was kind of a crazy situation. We were not obviously planning on it. I was nearly 50 years old. I just got diagnosed, you know, we found out like two weeks before I had to have this surgery come up and my life's on the line and my wife had children, uh, my, my stepson real young and she had to raise him by herself. And I was really worried about leaving her to raise another child by herself. I felt terrible about that mm -hmm. situation, but I got excited. I'd never had children myself. It's one thing that I wouldn't say I have, didn't, I have regrets on, but I was like, man, you know, I, I went from being nervous for a second in my head to being like, let's fucking go. Like I'm got really excited, went to the ultrasound, saw the baby's heartbeat. And I was like, dude, this is happening. Wow. Like it was still settling in. And then like, it was maybe about a couple of weeks later, still very early into the pregnancy. Um, I find out that, you know, I, I, it, the cancer had metastasized to my, my, my lungs mm -hmm. and my lower right lobe would have to be removed. So I had that removed that week. Your lower, lower, right lower lobe. right lobe. Yeah. Down here. So I had a little tent and <laughs> I can't feel anything from midline to here today. And like, I have no feeling at all, like, because they really? put a nerve block, it um. never wore off. So it, it's a problem in the gym, you know, like with a lot of things i have nerve pain like if i do this like just brush my hand it's super painful but if i press hard it doesn't hurt it's just weird oh, that's interesting yeah i'm still trying to figure that one out but then that week i get the surgery done they're like yeah you're officially stage four and then i find out my wife lost the baby you mm -hmm. know like and that was one week dude of my life right i've been through a lot of absurd things and i felt so horrible like um you know, but I, I, I kind of talk about resiliency a lot and I, I kind of went right through that. You know, I was trying to be there for my wife. She took it exceptionally hard and still we just had Mother's Day. The baby would have been one this Mother's oh. Day and in this February. So I didn't, you know, you don't want to pick that scab. You know, I don't want to bring it up. So I, it's, it's just hard. It's real personal. And I probably shouldn't talk about it publicly, but you know, it, what, what, what it's about is resiliency too for, you got to put the work in, man. And had this happened like five, 10 years ago when I was still struggling, it might've been a really bad situation for me. Like, yeah. meaning I might've checked out, you know, because I feel like I, I don't know, you're not in control. Um, but tying it back to, you know, the commonality with history we were talking about. So I go to Warrior's Heart during this time. I was kind of setting the stage of like my mental health wasn't in the best position. I was doing better, you know, I was kind of moving in the right direction, but I wasn't, I wasn't where I should have been. You know, I was still suicidal, still battling depression and social anxiety. I could never do a podcast back then like this. I would have been terrified. It was just weird. Um, so I go to Warrior's Heart and Tom Spooner, I spent about 12 hours with the executive leadership of Warriors Heart trying to understand what they do for veterans. And he takes me out to this Native American burial site that's out there in Bandera. And they have a circle where they had a fire. And Tom is a former unit guy. He battled TBI and went through a lot of mental health challenges. Mm. And he's a, he's a legend in the, you know, 
you got different degrees, right? You can become a Green Beret or a SEAL, but there's levels to the game. I think Jocko talks about it sometimes. Like, I think I heard him talk about there's just levels, you know, like, you know, you can just go through the and, and get your, your tab. But then you have people like Nick Lavery who are like a warrior's warrior. Oh, yeah. Like, I want to talk about him because he's this freaking inspirational guy. He's working with you guys now too, right? Yeah, he'll be speaking for us this fall in, uh, awesome. at our gala in Nashville on September 14th. But I go out there and he goes, see that see that site right there? When we moved here, we, we wanted to – there was an archaeological dig maybe like 60 years ago with the Native Americans here. We wanted to be respectful, so we kind of filled it in. But we put the circle here, and he's like back when the warrior class of the Native Americans would go to battle – the elders would try to encourage the young, the warriors, to kind of tell their, their you know, their story mm. about the battles. And it's it's fascinating to me oh, because yeah. he's like, you take a glass, right? When guys are struggling with mental health, men and women are struggling, their cup is like this. It's three quarters full. And what he was trying to encourage people was, he's like, the, basically, when your glass is three quarters full, if your glass overfills, you know you're gonna you're gonna break. You know you're 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 really struggling. So they would encourage the warrior class to go around the campfire, and we do it still to this day. He kind of does it a little bit with uh, the people going through certain. Uh, they kind of go through the similar situation, but the young warriors would take their glass and they would f tell their stories and, and pour a little bit of their water across mm. the other people and they could be men and women that would never be warriors they've never seen battle and when they're telling their stories they're getting it off their chest they're pouring a little bit into their glass so their glass is going down so he said man one day i wanted to put this thing to the test and he kind of went told me the story it was like you know i got a you know accommodation one time i think it was a silver star for something and he really struggled with that 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 role, you know, in the military, it's like an award, you know, it's, you know, you're getting uh, a medal for your, your valor, but those situations aren't always good. Oh yeah. And so he's like, man, I wanted to go out and put it to the test. And I won't share that story because it's not my story to share, you know, publicly, but he told me what, the, how he put it to the test. And I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on it that, you know, he wasn't sure how he's going to react, but he kind of told this story that he'd never told before ever and to he was doing like a shooting class or something and one of the guys called him the next day he was like a roughneck a man's man you know like you know from texas handlebar mustache big dude whatever the situation was and he like got a call from the guy the next day and he got through the story but he's like man that really that story really fucked me up dude like mm. you know he wasn't in the military never been the, the battle never been the war and he was like dude that story just really fucked me up. And that's because he's pouring some of it, just a little bit of his story is getting wow. told and it's uplifting to him. And I think he's told the story maybe he said 11 times since then. And I just really appreciated him sharing that with me because I was still kind of feeling like, you know, look, dude, I tell people all the time, I, I quote Joe Rogan at every event, I say, comparison's the thief of joy. Yes. And I'm like, if you compare yourself to others, especially guys in our community, like I don't claim to be some awesome, you know, yeah, yeah I, I did like 13 deployments or whatever it was. I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, North Africa, I've done, you know, Palestine. I've done some things, but there's half of my, people in my network have done way more rad things. They're way more accomplished with their military service, but it's not about that. Because some people like a Goggins, people give him shit because he's only done one deployment. I'm like, maybe he didn't get the fucking chance to do it, guys. Like, he's not out there saying he's the baddest motherfucker, like Navy SEAL, most accredited, you know, right. killer or whatever, you know, that that thing is. He's just trying to inspire people. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.